I don't know if you're aware or not, but there's been a giant meteor explosion, atmospheric, not on the ground, luckily, uh, that happened over Iceland again, uh, now for the first time in about 30 years, but it's one of the major impacts that have happened uh, on Earth. And uh, I'm not sure if you remember this, but Scientific American back in 98 talked about a meteor strike in 97. Uh, they call it fire over the ice and how it had come in and exploded just over the top. It was very much like a Tangusta type of event where it uh, exploded hard enough to be like a nuclear detonation. And uh, they went around trying to find pieces of it and found pieces of it even close to Reykjavik and where the... Uh, uh, glacier rift is there and, and where you can actually see volcanic magma coming out of there where the uh, it seems like the island there is getting twisted a little and torn open slightly and uh, that's uh, indeed happening all over earth in a lot of places and uh, in Kenya now and a few other places it's really causing large white cracks and I believe that what's happening here is the earth's crust is uh, tearing slightly due to the pull on the tectonic plates uh, due to the fact that we have a, a crust depth and then a magma that is trying to harden below it things are moving and pushing back and forth and uh, this causes what we found is you know Pangea tearing apart and so things that are on a much longer geological scale would show small things like this um, if it kept happening over Africa and going, going, you'd find that Africa is slightly stretching out uh, north to south. Now, all these lines seem to be ripping pretty much east to west. But uh, I digress. Uh, this uh, here was back in again in 1997, and they had investigated it. And they, uh, in it was uh, hell from the heavens, meteorite impacts in the desert, and where it had turned the sand to glass. And indeed, there's a sea of glass or a sea of molten sand that's out off of Egypt uh, over in northern Liberia or southern Liberia actually uh, out almost into Central Africa where a large impact had happened caused a great catastrophe a long time ago and uh, we're not sure if that whenever it happened was a isolated event or if it was one that had broken into many pieces and that was just one piece of it uh, now we look at uh, ancient um, records in the ice and things, and it seems that the last ice age ended abruptly with a gigantic meteor attack that was very much similar to this, but hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, this uh, meteor is falling from the sky, and uh, perhaps this is your story in the Bible where one third of the stars fell from heaven or whenever all of that had gone on. You know, they used to believe that the earth was held above with a glass dome. And you can find this in the Bible if you look up Bible Earth Model. And that there were little bubbles. And those were the stars that were actually up in the glass dome. This is the firmament above that they have. And they believed that they had lost a lot of the other stars. Perhaps that's why it was only the Milky Way part that was left. Because they had all fallen to earth in a primordial time. And this leads one to believe that they know about large meteor strikes from way back when that were causing these problems. And of course, in their mentality, this would be God literally hurling a fireball at you. You know, this is the God of the skies being very mad and the God of heaven on throwing things at you. Uh, there's a Sumerian tablet, which uh, kind of conspicuously res it refers to a uh, large flash or an explosion, uh, which people that read it kind of correlate it to being a uh, giant volcanic uh, eruption like Vesuvius or something like that way up in the mountains far from there and uh, or a meteor attack and it could go either way but uh, instantly after that is a story of the giant flood that had happened through the area that in um, Lagash got 15 meters deep 15 cubits deep drowned everybody the cattle they talk about this a uh, great flood where even just the ziggurat was sitting above the water looking like it was poking up out of water. It was floating as the way they describe it. So all of this 
mountain ice had melted off at one time, and indeed a, a great mountain volcano that had been quiet for a long time, like Vesuvius and so on, can really take people off. But if it was in an ice area that led to uh, the rivers that lead to the major river running through your area, if this happened far enough away, you would see an event and then shortly after here would come gigantic mudslides and floods and things and if you weren't aware or prepared there'd be no way to stop it indeed the floodplain of eden that's known between the tigris and euphrates is very very shallow above sea level and so whenever the area does flood it doesn't do it just right around the little river kind of like the nile did but it uh, spreads out wide if you get just a couple of feet higher in flood it's basically going to cover as far as you can see. And it can get worse than that. So when this flood had happened at 15 foot depth in Maharsa, then no one's sure exactly how deep it was everywhere else, but it did kill off a major portion of the population. And this is believed to be the story in the Bible where God said it would never flood again, but then it did. So Abraham left because there were false gods that they were now worshiping because it was untrue something had happened they had lost their god this odd type of effect but i want to i want to show you something here i want to look into this because uh, there's stories all over the place there's this meteor that had struck over here someplace in the uk yeah i think and and uh it's got um well it says danger so it was from a uk uk site but it appears to be here in america it looks like it with the kids clothes and things i'm fairly sure anyhow here's a meteor strike that had hit the ground and uh just been taped off by the police until someone gets there and this thing apparently cools off and they're letting the kids sit around and perhaps breathe the vapor coming off this i'm not sure if that's a great idea or not so i have to look into and indeed, what makes this kind of an oddity, because this is kind of like what happened in Russia just a few years back, in I think 2013, where they had a giant meteor that exploded over the atmosphere, and the shockwaves alone hurt like 1,500 people, flying glass, it busted all the glass out of a lot of buildings, car windows, uh, anybody that was within, you know, 35 miles of it or something had all their glass shattered and so on and uh, it could have been heard for over 250 miles or is it 250 kilometers away uh clearly and uh you know like a thunder and a clear blue sky and they're like what the hell and it was that far away this one was right over a air force base station called um in in Thule, greenland my father used to be stationed here uh, for a period of time setting up some of the electronic warfare and systems that we had there and they also used to fly uh, flights out of there off the Sea of Ohosk in Russia and get uh, Russian stuff and, and pictures perhaps and they what they were trying to do a lot of times was taunt some of the fighters up so they could see a, a MiG-25 because it looking like just a flight plane and nothing that was really a, a troublesome thing. They would come in and fly within the airspace, you know, within 200 miles of the uh, border, and they would send, scramble out planes. And so they would uh, uh, send them off of it and try to get pictures. Indeed, my dad took some famous pictures of the first MiG-25 that we had seen, but that wasn't even his job. The uh, photographer that had come up there had gotten sick and never even took off the camera lens and shot just about a roll of film for my dad, pointed it out to him. The man looked at my dad and he was green as hell and just handed the camera to him. And because that plane was right there, my dad started shooting some shots out the window. Um, and it's still in Strategic Air Command headquarters to this day on the mess hall wall. But um, blown up to about a 20-foot photo, I believe, along with a lot of others from different things, but uh, the reason that they uh, got to detect this and they got a lot of telemetry and intelligence off of it was this is supposed to detect whenever there's a nuclear incoming or ICBM missile that launches and comes towards the United States. This is the one we would find in between here, and indeed you can send strikes north of here and go straight over the polar cap to Russia itself and uh, and things, so this, uh, this is kind of an interim type device and it has a lot of ELANT or Electronic intelligence devices there, 
And uh, so let's look into that a little bit more, and I'll show you something about Tula Greenland. Uh, here they have these giant radar satellite setups, and they run off microwaves and things, and a Doppler setup too with it, and they run in conjunction with each other. And you can't really go into discussion about how it actually works, but uh, they can pan the sky pretty well. And uh, this is where they get the ELINT and stuff, and you can uh, it, it can register some 1,200 miles away um, moving radar, and uh, so it's pretty neat. And uh, from this, they were able to get the telemetry. But then again, with it sending the alarm through the system, we ended up having to go to a uh, orange red alert, a DEFCON 4 situation, and there's some 2,000. Uh, nuclear missile silos that, that were all set off and went to alert where the two people would hold the key and wait for the the uh, confirmation so uh, because it looked like it was a direct attack on this site which again could have caused something wrong and at least there is a lot of communication from people and it didn't hit the ground it was some 25 26 miles above this place like 40 kilometers above it so halfway between us in space, you know, up in the uh, in the upper cloud layers where it exploded. Luckily, there was no plane in the area; it would have just been vaporized. And I think all of us have a fear that uh, something that killed off the dinosaurs that we're aware of now could really cause a problem to us in the United States and so on. And uh, it looks like the great flood of everything uh, that raised sea levels some. Um, 400 to 450 foot around the world was whenever the um, continental ice shelf had gotten hidden by not one like this but hundreds at one time pelting it and I always had the belief that this is the remnant that we're scattered and, and still left floating uh, kind of like a portion of the asteroid belt left over from whenever the earth formed and whenever Tiamat and Ki had knocked together to form this and the leftover was the asteroid belt that it didn't leave everything in a uniform line that some shot off like buckshot and it goes back and forth indeed there's a a cloud that's known of that we go through that shattered up small pieces and usually nothing bigger than a car comes through at maximum uh, and you see any meter showers and things like that that all happen too uh, this is an artist's conception of kind of what it would look like going from a distance, perhaps looking at it from Nova Scotia, back at it. And uh, let's see, here we have Orion over here in the sky and so on. But wham, that hit that happened on there. Whenever this happened in 10,500 B.C., there would have been one there, one here, 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 one here going across and coming in not all at once but coming in a string effect as the world was spinning and kind of like whenever Jupiter got hit years ago with the shoemaker Levy fragments that happened where it peppered it as it went around well in our version it happened a lot more rapidly but instead of coming in just one area it stringed out all through the Atlantic North Carolina up through Michigan and even up into Canada and the, at that time of course was a continental ice shelf Here's some info on Thule Air Force Base. It's up in northwestern Greenland. That's there, and uh, so let's see if it'll show you a map of it. Yeah, so it's kind of up in the top left-hand corner. We see that bulge that comes out right there, and uh, that's where it kind of is, somewhat in that area. Here's a view of it coming poking off the edge, and there are times when this all freezes over between here and the island, and indeed part of the air base that's landing here. There's part of it that actually is on permafrost that wouldn't work correctly if it was undone. Now this is also part of the Air Force Space Command right here. And it's also part of Strategic Air Command, which is where my father was hooked up to it. And both of these things worked in conjunction with NORAD and Air Force Space Command uh, here. And uh, it was known as the 21st Space Wing. Uh, that portion of it, but then the Strategic Air Command had its own classified uh, group that was out there doing their ELINT. Um, it's home to the 821st Airborne Group and responsible for air base support in the Thule Defense Area for the multinational population of Team Thule. 
So in other words, it's the entire Arctic Circle above that area. And there's a quite a bit going on there. They have um, operates uh, ballistic missile early warning systems. And uh, these are designed to uh, detect and track ICBMs and things like that, like I was telling you. So it really shows this um, uh, place was hooked up for this type of intelligence or to even gather more information on it. And I can't wait to see what they tell you and the actual speed of it, direction, and when it exploded. Because in that effect, they should be able to tell you where a lot of the meteorites landed. Um, you know, there was meteorites have been known for a long, long time, and they were always seen as something that came from heaven, and they were fallen stars, and they were very dense, you know, and there's your metal that are in them. Even King Tut's dagger is made of this uh, meteorite material, and uh, I've got a couple other things that I've been trying to compile together to show you some more. Um, indeed, it, Recently, I had four videos actually get corrupted after making all of them. A couple of them I feel like were really uh, some good work, and I'm going to have to go back over them again. Uh, but anyhow, so this uh, this uh, runs off of like a Loran station, right? And so Loran has got the world's largest radio tower that goes on to it. And uh, so it's long-range radar and long-range contact. Uh, indeed, it, it's what's patched through when anybody's in anywhere of that area. Uh, had this been in place when the Titanic happened, uh, perhaps a lot of other things would have gone on differently. But uh, it still would have sunk before they got there. Anyhow, the, the village stays now right where it used to be an Inuit village that they had moved. And they moved them to a, a new area and gave them all brand new housing, uh, peered up off the ground and all this type of stuff. And uh, during that time, everybody was uh, into, you know, and still are now, into uh, if you displace somebody or anything like that. So they freaked out. They gave them $500,000. And uh, between fifteen dollars and $25,000 each to each one of these people, and uh, known as the Dundas, and uh, kind of like Dindus. And uh, so they displaced them a little bit, but gave them a lot, much better area that was right next to them and something they could still utilize. It's only because this area was extremely flat. And uh, here's a view of it the way that it looked in 1955. And the air wing that was out there. And they have fighters and stuff here and there. And then the hangars, they have bigger airplanes and so on. But these are kept out on the flight lines. And uh, my dad wasn't out here at this time, but shortly after. And then back again uh, through the late 60s and early 70s when they were setting up the rest of their Elant things. It's a beautiful place. There are about two months out of the year where it thaws out. And uh, you can actually see how huge the runways are and how they've built all this onto the area. And so there's not any snow on here. When the snow gets on, this packs and goes all the way out longer. Um, if there's a side wind in here, you actually come across, and I don't even see where it is, the landing area. Uh, maybe it's through this that you come through, but uh, with a side wind coming, and they say that that's all on permafrost, that it never had been turned into a concrete runway. Uh, off in the distance here is an island that's close to there and was used for a lot of other things too. Um, here's a tugboat they have in the harbor, and it actually runs... Um, little tours and things like that, but also it's extremely active during the winter. They drive it up one of these canals, and then it freezes. They pull it up on top of the ice and leave it there through the entire winter. And so here's a corridor area and uh, that they run a lot of where you get recon off of the Soviet Union in the Sea of Ohosk. And uh, I know this isn't Sea of Ohosk here. That would be off of Alaska. Uh, Tule is way up here in this top corner, as you see there. So it's got a modern air base that was hooked up through the 50s and into the 60s in Strategic Air Command, and this is again where my dad was hooked up through it and so on. But, uh... Enough about that and the fact that it's got aerospace defense and stuff going on and they had made a lot of missile silos there 
and indeed all of this type of work had been done there and turned it into a modern Air Force base where they had taken people from a lot of different areas and uh, really the entire shipping yard, by the way, and, and pulled them up there to do so. But yeah, so Tule Air Force Base in Greenland. Now here's NASA's actual um, census they have on all the bolide events that apparently had happened between 1988 and 2018. These are all of the falling stars people had seen in certain areas, meteor strikes and stuff and so on. And you see the blue ones go from mild all the way through green. When we get into yellow, things are really, you know, unless it's a direct hit, it can be a problem. They get up all the way to red. And indeed red, I believe that is the um, one that happened over Russia that was so giant now. This one that we're talking about is a 2.2. It is also going to be a red, and it's going to be the only other red on the map. So it shows you all this um, happening. And uh, the real fear is is that what, we, what, what the rare thing is is the one twice the size of the red. Now, whenever the twice the size of the red happens and it hits the ground where the red spot is, it's going to kill everybody in that whole area where the red spot is and cause problems for everybody on the planet somewhat. If there was one twice that big, it would take out an entire continent wherever it hit and screw up the earth for hundreds of years. Perhaps even kick us back into another ice age, which on the scale of things is not too far in the distance actually people keep talking about global warming but it looks like if you look at the heartbeat of ice ages we're pretty much due another one here's a note from one of the scientists that are actually there he tells you a meteor explodes with 2.1 kilotons not 2.2 uh, force uh, 43 kilometers, you know, 26 miles above missile early warning radar at Tule Air Force Base. Now he says, we're still here, so they correctly concluded that it was not a Russian first strike on us, and there are nearly 2,000 nukes on alert ready to launch. And so there you, there you can see where it hit, or where Tule is. Now where it actually hit at is supposed to be out here somewhere. And in the next few days, we'll try to get a trajectory on it. If there's any interesting uh, data or knowledge that comes out of it, I'll definitely let you know. Something like this is always interesting, and it should be more interesting. I've always thought that we should really get on top of the idea of uh, trying to track and put a lot of things into space that would actually kill off meteors because... It's meteors that killed off all the dinosaurs and caused all of life to go, and it would be our own negligence if we were to know all the things we know now and to sit here and just geek out and watch one smack the earth, take out a third of its population, if not send us back into an ice age and take us down to a finite population and recycle us all again. And uh, I don't think anybody wants to see that. Now that we know and have the knowledge and that we have the capabilities, we should really try to do something about it. Um, they do have weapons there that are extremely, um, what they call Black World. They have weapons there that shoot out uh, magnetic pulses. They have ones that shoot out microwaves. They have uh, different things that uh, they've tried and perfected in that area to help out. But it would really only be somewhat of a defense for themselves. Anyhow, I'm going to keep up with this. Y'all take care. We'll look into it.